see and hear us okay? I can, um, and you can hear me okay? Yes, and see you. All, all good. Cool. Brilliant. So um, we are live, just to let you know. So don't, uh, don't read out your card details or defame a Russian oligarch. I don't <laughs> But um, so uh, welcome back everyone to our second session of Out in the Past at EPIC, the Irish Emigration Museum. And we are joined by Vicky Iglikovsky Broad, who um, is your position, Vicky, is Principal record Specialist, is that right? At the yeah, Principal uh, record Specialist in kind of specialising in diverse histories. Great. Um, at the National Archives in Kew. So um, thanks very much for joining us and I'm really looking forward to your talk, which will be on uh, a hidden archive of letters, love letters between men at the National Archives. So uh, Vicky, do you need to share screen? Yes, I will just attempt to do that now. Um, so our invisible tech ground on James to make sure that that's enabled. Cool. Sorry, I was just hoping that my uh, PowerPoint would come up there somewhere. Let me try that again. Uh, can you see the presentation slides? I can, yep, that looks great. Yep, and if I move forward, all good? All good. Okay, well, do just interrupt if there are any issues with uh, sound or visuals. Sure, and just let you know, Vicky, and also the audience, if you have any questions for Vicky, please drop them in the YouTube live chat, and then um, at the end of Vicky's talk as well, I'll, I'll re relay them back to you. So that's how that will we'll go ahead. And so I'll I'll drop off the camera now and sit back and enjoy the talk. So take it away. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, and sorry for the the slight delay in starting. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here uh, talking to you about one of my absolute favourite kind of archival uh, subjects. Um, essentially, what I'm going to be talking to you about is this kind of what I'm calling a hidden archive of letters, uh, love letters between men in the National Archives collections. Um, so firstly, a brief content warning. Um, this presentation will reference historic homophobic attitudes, uh, particularly in terms of past state legislation and policing practices. Um, and the presentation will also use words from the time at moments uh, when I'm kind of directly quoting from the records. Um, and some of these words are now considered outdated or offensive, uh, but I'm kind of using them to be authentic to the records. Um, I'll also use the word queer in this talk, um, particularly because it's the most commonly used word that I've come across. Um, for men to self-describe their sexuality in the 1920s and 1930s, which is, is the period that I'm really focusing in on. Um, and I'll also use the, the term LGBTQ as more of an umbrella term to talk uh, more generally about um, various sexual um, and gender identities and talk across time periods. Um, so with those notes, um, let's get stuck into some of the content. Uh, in November 1920, the youthful Ernest or Ernie Smith was arrested. At 22 years old, he worked as a clerk in Belfast and described himself as five five in height of medium build, about 26 inch waist with dark hair and blue eyes. He had an interest in art and literature. He loved the pre-Raphaelites and Oscar Wilde, but abhorred ragtime jazz. So why was this young railway clerk arrested? Found in Ernie's possession were actually hundreds of letters, um, a handful of which survive. Um, and the image on screen is just illustrative of kind of what would have survived. It, it's not actually an accurate representation, unfortunately. Um, problematically for Ernie, these letters were been between himself and many other men, or as the police termed them, sodomites. These letters provided criminal evidence of Ernie's relationships with other men in a time when the law essentially criminalized their love. Even the sheer number of letters he was found with um, can essentially help us question some of our assumptions we might have about the past. 
uh, showing that love letters and queer networks between men have always existed. Uh, so in the National Archives records are a small but ultimately unknown number of love letters between men. These love letters often read like they could be written between any lovers of any gender in any period. They openly display love, joy and affection. Um, so one example on screen here, a letter and a quote for you. I just want to be with your arms around me and soak myself in the atmosphere of contentment. But the letters we have from the 1920s and 30s um, are from a time when writing these words down was potentially incriminating. In our collections, there are these occasional rare love letters between men, but also letters between queer male friends, talking openly about their lives um, and their friendships. In this talk, what I really hope to do is give you back a little bit of the voice of people in the archives that often couldn't be heard in their own lifetime, in their own words. Um, so I'm going to try and do this by exploring three brief case studies uh, where such letters between men materialise in our collections, um, including the case I started with of Ernie. What these letters show is kind of a normality almost that was possible for some queer pe people in the past, but also a defiance to love despite the restrictions imposed upon people. So firstly, for a little bit of context and scene setting. In the past, the state played a major role in repressing and controlling the lives of gay and bisexual men and women. Um, and as the state archive for England, Wales, the National Archives reflects much of this negative history. Um, so that's very much the context that, that the bulk of our records relating to LGBTQ lives comes from. Now this attempt by the state to suppress sexuality in the past has actually left us with many potential sources for the experiences of LGBTQ individuals, uh, from court records, uh, witness statements, uh, sometimes personal items that were seized in maybe police raids or similar things, um, and even these letters that I'm talking about today. In an era where keeping personal items about love between men was done at great personal risk, these letters offer a really unique insight into the lives of queer men before partial decriminalization. So if criminalization is the reason we have these items, conversely, it's the reason we don't have these kind of items about same-sex relationships between women or individuals we might now consider to be trans. Um, it was not illegal to be a lesbian or to subvert your gender identity, um, although society made neither of these things easy for people. The absence of policing of lesbian and trans identities leads to an absence of archival items in our collections, including an absence of comparative love letters, similar to the ones I'm talking about today. Um, so they just don't exist in the same way in our collections. While we do have records about lesbian and transgender lives, uh, some of the examples can be seen as those on screen, they're less common and often more found in genealogical collections or personal papers. Um, and though, although I really hope one day to be, find, be able to find, for example, love letters between women, um, at the moment they certainly seem like they're, they're kind of undiscovered in our collections. Um, so that's just really to explain why this, this talk today is so focused on love letters between men. Uh, very much it's dictated by what survives in our collections. Um, so back to Ernie, our clerk from Belfast. These men who'd written to him uh, letters from all over the country had supposedly got in contact with Ernie through their classified adverts in a publication called The Link, uh, which can be seen on screen. The Link was a Lonely Heart style publication from the 1920s that sought to connect people. Um, and in practice, it was used kind of against its original purpose to include, um, to connect many LGBT people. In October 1920, Ernie had placed a personal advertisement in the link con containing just the following few words. Youth, island, 18, fond of music, literature, well-educated, refined, desire, sincere friend, own sex, any age to 20, sorry, any age to 35, all letters answered. In his allocated 25 words, Ernie had dropped in certain words and phrases and hints music, literature, sincere friend, and most significantly, own sex. These words would serve both as a coded signal of his desire to meet other men, but also ultimately to incriminate him. 
So we can follow Ernie's relationship with one of these individuals pretty closely. We can follow his relationship with Jeffrey or Jeff Smith, an ex-serviceman from Enfield. Because of Jeff's proximity to London, the Metropolitan Police requested that the Belfast Police send Ernie and Jeff's correspondence to the Met, which leads to this, these letters survival in our collections. And the one that ones that survives are really kind of just a handful, um, but they're still really quite informative. Um, in our collections, just to clarify, we hold Metropolitan Police records, but not other, um, other police records from across the country. Um, so that's why it's kind of quite unique that we have these ones. So the pair appear to have initiated contact on the 12th of September 1920, when Jeff wrote to Ernie saying, I feel sure we would be able to become excellent friends. The letters sent between them over a number of months provide a picture of their friendship and relationship. The link and some subsequent letters gave them a chance to correspond despite the significant distance between Enfield and Belfast. Through their vivid and open correspondence, we can see that Ernie and Jeff pursued a relationship, although whether they were ever able to actually meet is unclear. The intention, however, is clear. They talk about their fondness for each other and their mutual attraction. The letters also recount their sexual dalliances with other men in what appears to almost be a kind of competitive attempt to make each other jealous. In one of the letters, Jeff writes longingly, may the time soon come, Ernie, when we can meet and allow our sensuality to have full swing with each other. On the 2nd of October, 1920, the correspondence continued. I'm longing to revel in the joys of your naked body. So we also see queer people gathering in person rather than just this kind of more distant form of connection. And we see this in both private houses and clubs. Within these spaces, letters were occasionally found. Sometimes these letters were found with their intended recipient and sometimes with the original author, never to have actually been sent. Nine letters and a Christmas card were found at 25 Fitzroy Square, London in 1927. This basement flat was home to Bobby and Constance, where they would hold parties for a small group of their working class friends. Inside the flat, the individuals were observed to be dancing, singing, kissing and cuddling, and sometimes naked. Bobby, a professional dancer on the West End stage, would perform dances for his friends in costume. The gramophone would keep them entertained for hours. This was essentially a space where people had the freedom to be themselves away from some, some of society's pressures, particularly the pressures around conforming to uh, society's ideas of sexuality at the time. After weeks of observation by the police, this flat was unfortunately raided in, the 19, in 1927 under the accusations of being a disorderly house. And this was very much because of the same sex activity between men going on inside the flat. The letters were written to Bobby and Bert, who were both present during the raid. In the photograph, Bobby is wearing the long kind of gender transgressive skirt and is bare chested. Um, and Bert is wearing the kind of 1920s style swimming costume. Bert was the nephew of Bobby and said to police that he often stayed at the Fitzrovia flat at weekends. Bobby was teaching him to dance. During the raid on the venue, their photographs were seized as potential evidence alongside, um, sorry, the letters were seized as potential evidence alongside the photographs, uh, which you can see on screen, and also other items. So the other items don't survive, but we do know originally that some of the um, outfits and costumes that people were wearing were also seized as well. Photographs with people in such as these are really rare to survive. Um, so we sometimes see them in lists of evidence, but this is a really rare, su rare surviving example. Uh, you can also see the names that have been an annotated of individuals above their, um, their heads in the photograph, um, and they were added by police. On screen is an image of the original handwritten letters seized during the raid, but we also have typed up versions as well as the kind of handwritten versions on the headed paper. These letters don't just tell us about love, but also about queer friendships and international networks. One of Bobby's friends, uh, known as McNamara, we aren't given his first name, had not long moved to America 
and wrote to him regularly from there saying, we can still write to each other in sincere friendship. And when I come back, you'll be the first I come and see. McNamara's letters give some really fascinating details about their lives. They're filled with wonderful, affectionate nicknames, queer humour, which at times is wonderfully lewd, um, and also an underlying, underlying love and companionship between friends that stretches um, between Bobby and McNamara across the Atlantic. These letters start from the time of McNamara's initial journey and arrival in America in 1922. He described his life prior to this being one of a poor working harlot from the streets of London. While writing these letters, he is traveling extensively, mentioning San Francisco, New Orleans, California, um, and at one point describing his dear Bobby as the campus thing between London and San Francisco. One of the most revealing parts of these letters is the relationship uh, that McNamara develops in America. Uh, using many phrases associated more with kind of heterosexual relationships and marriage, such as husband, marriage and honeymoon. Despite this being many decades before same sex marriage was legalized, they were still very much conceptualizing their relationship in these terms. McNamara described his husband, Harry, as a real lover, but also calls him jealous and stubborn. Harry won't let me go to work. It really is dreadful as I'm cultivating such extravagant tastes. One of the standout things from these letters is the terms of address the pair used towards each other, such as Lady of the Camellias, my dearest camping Bessie, you brazen harlot, and old Auntie Aggie. An obvious campness and humour shines through. Police paid particular attention to any mentions of kind of alternative gender expression, such as McNamara writing to Bobby, my dear sister, one day you must come over, and the wonderful sign off. Yours as ever, your old drunken auntie Elizabeth. Kisses and kind thoughts to Sister Nelly. A theme in several of these letters to Bert and Bobby is the queer scene in London and the rich possibilities of socialising that 1920s London offered, um, which went significantly beyond their private gatherings at Fitzroy, Fitzroy Square. One of the letters received was from Lindsay, Leslie Kinder, who had worked at the Adelphi Rooms as a waiter, age 26, and wrote to Bobby from Brixton Prison following his imprisonment after the raid there. He had been sentenced to 21 months hard labour. Um, so this shows some of the connections between the different spaces that Bobby was in communication with someone that, that um, worked at the Adelphi Rooms and had been arrested there. In a letter from Bill to Bert, who's called Honey Bunch in the letter, the pair are looking to meet and go out. Bill states they can easily find a dance and there are plenty of dances, so don't forget to come, suggesting a thriving queer scene at the time, despite the underground nature of it. Um, and indeed, you can see some of the uh, images on screen of some of the spaces that were available. So the Adelphi rooms that I've already mentioned, um, but also the Chelsea Arts Ball um, as well, and Lady Malcolm's Servants Balls that, that were quite um, transgressive at the time with working class um, people uh, often cross-dressing and things like that in quite public spaces like the Royal Albert Hall. So there were spaces available for people. Uh, these two very different references in the letters demonstrate the risks and opportunities these spaces offered at the time. The C's letters addressed to Burt are predominantly love letters. They show some of the complexities of love between men, including unrequited love. One letter from Eric is written in several stages at different points in the day and is kind of quite an intense heartfelt expression of someone in love but not being loved back. You say that you could never love me, but that you can offer me friendship, which you say is far greater than love. I cannot agree with you about this, my dear. I must confess that I don't see how I can keep love out of my side of the friendship. It's a simple true fact that I love you, baby dear. So that was Eric writing to Bert in 1927. Eric also continues, I have an intense desire to make you happy. I worship the beauty of your body and your dear, dear face and hair and eyes, and I want to hold you very close to me. However, it seems that Bert only wants friendship. As Eric writes, we're all foolish sometimes when it comes to matters of the heart. A letter sent after this date seems to be between Eric and Peter, 
And this letter talks of the frustration of not being able to speak publicly about their feelings. I wanted to shout to the whole of the office that I was in love with you. This underlines that while relationships were certainly possible between men, they had to be secretive and hidden from work and family. And that obviously put a lot of pressure on individuals. The versions of these letters held in the National Archives collections contain markings from the police. The, authority, the authorities indicated the sections they found particularly concerning by underlining them in green and red. Even the forms of address and sign off could be problematic in the eyes of the law. Affectionate nicknames could be read as a sign of homosexuality or transgression when written between men, such as the sign offs, Peter Darling, Honey Love, My Baby Dear, and always just Eric with a kiss. The nature of having records because of the raids means that we only have one side of the conversation. Um, and that's different from the case of Ernie and Jeff, who we had both sides because of the way the letters were sent to police. So this really leaves us with many questions. How did Bert really feel about his heartbroken correspondent? What was Bobby writing in return in his return letters about his life in London? Maybe he spoke about his gatherings he held at Fitzroy Square. Maybe uh, prior to moving to America, Matt Namara actually attended these gatherings as well. So lots of questions remain unanswered. The final letters I want to explore with you relate to a brilliant club. The first two examples of letters here have been from the 1920s. So now we're kind of shifting to the 1930s. Here we see a hidden network of spaces um, across London, such as private members clubs, pubs, bathhouses, restaurants and dance halls that provided a relatively safe space where men could meet other men regardless of the law. There was an undeniable thriving queer scene, often quite bohemian, flamboyant, gender subversive, fun and camp. Um, and that's not to say that these spaces would have been available to everyone. They came with significant risk. Some of them would have had certain class dynamics at play. Um, the price might have been prohibitive to people attending, um, but ultimately these spaces did exist. The 1920s, uh, sorry, the 1930s saw more and more of these clubs thrive, disappear and pop, pop up again. Um, and just to name a few examples, there was Billy's Club that opened in 1935. This club was very much centered around music hall artists um, and openly featured queer musicians such as Fred Barnes, who was very well known at the time. Uh, the Shim Sham Club uh, opened in 1935 as well on Wardour Street. This was a club really known as London's miniature Harlem and it championed uh, African-American music on the jazz scene at the time. And it was essentially a rare black queer space, so really quite unique. Um, and when it got shut down, it, it kind of reopened as the Rainbow Roof. So a very kind of resilient space that, um, that clearly there was demand to reopen. Um, and in the 1930s, we can see Holland Park Ballroom that was rented out for drag dances. Um, and this was one of the costumes uh, worn by one of the individuals in attendance at one of those drag dances. Um, and that actually survives in our collections, which is a rare, really rare uh, example of an actual costume that survives um, as well. Um, but the particular club I'm focusing in on is the Caravan Club, which was a key venue in the era, a bohemian haven for gay men. Um, connected with this club are two particularly important letters in our collection. So the Caravan Club was essentially a makeshift private members club in the basement of 81 Endel Street on the edge of Soho. Uh, and it was described as London's greatest bohemian rendezvous. And it uh, says that on the ticket on screen. The club was owned by Jack Neve, known as Ironfoot Jack, and William Reynolds, known as Billy. For the price of one shilling for members and one shilling six on the door, all night gaiety could be uh, enjoyed while dancing to the music, music of Charlie, the club's accordion player. Um, and it was actually only open for six weeks, this venue. Um, and I think you can kind of see that in, in the images that it's quite um, makeshift and bohemian, feels like it's been pulled together in, in a rush. In the venue, it was noted that the small dance floor was crowded and the number was too large to allow dancing properly. Men were dancing with men and women with women. 
Uh, so we have these fantastic photographs of the interior of the caravan club. Um, although they're black and white, you can possibly imagine the kind of colours that might have been in there, the, the muted tones, the rich tones. Um, but also I think it's important to note that we see these photographs um, devoid of people. They were, they were taken uh, after the raid on the venue took place. Uh, but actually at the time, this would have been filled with people when it was open. Um, and the space at the, the foregr in the foreground of the photo uh, was the dance floor. So that really would have been packed full of people. Now, in the early hours of the morning on the 25th of August, 1934, a number of plainclothes policemen entered the club pretending to be visitors. They then raided the venue. Among the police witness statements, reports and photographs of the raid and trial of the, are personal letters that were used as evidence in court. And these demonstrate a fascinating and unusually personal reflection on what it meant to be queer at the time. So the first letter we have was addressed, to, addressed from Cyril to his darling Morris, and it was found at the scene of the raid. The author Cyril was just 22 and writes, I was very disappointed that you were not coming to the club tonight and describes counting the hours until I could see you. It signifies the importance of the caravan club as a space where Cyril could be himself and meet with Morris. Um, although the letter seems to indicate that Cyril is keener on Morris than he is in return. Um, queer heartache is a common theme, uh, is as common a theme in these letters as queer love, uh, which I think is interesting and underlies how relatable they are um, they have the full range of emotions that any other uh, love letters would have as well. Very little is known about Cyril, Morris and their relationship other than what is contained in the letter. Cyril ends by writing, I only wish that I was going away with you, just you and I to eat, sleep and make love together. As the club was being raided, Cyril ripped up the letter and hid it under a divan. It was pieced together and typed up into its current format by police. Um, and that's why there's a, a kind of note in the top right hand corner that says exhibit four on there. Another letter was found in a hotel bedroom on the Isle of Wight connected to the caravan club case in a follow up raid. Um, and it was found just in the following re weeks after that. Um, and it tells us a little bit more about Cyril. It was written from Cyril to his dear friend Billy, the owner of the caravan club. The letter describes how he has only been queer since coming to London two years ago, showing the importance of London to his sense of identity. The letter also reveals that he has a wife and a little girl and says that he is still interested in women occasionally. So I think this is a really interesting, um, rare insight into a how someone self defines in their own language um, and also an open declaration of bisexuality, which tends to be particularly hidden in archival records. Normally we only really get a, a kind of snapshot of someone's life and we don't see that, that full context in their um, description of how they uh, feel about their sexuality themselves. Um, and in this case, we have the original uh, letter in our collections and the envelope it was delivered in as well. The letter ends with the powerful words, Please be a dear boy and destroy this note. Cyril, as with every other letter writer in this presentation, was only too aware of the implications if it was found. So I've covered these cases in kind of chronological order. Um, and each case, I think, really brings something different um, in terms of what the letters can tell us. Uh, they're kind of there's similarities that you can draw across the letters, but also quite um, distinct differences. So um, more distant kind of forms of correspondence, reflections on queer friendships, and also um, personal reflections on identity as well. Um, I've intentionally chosen very much to give the letters the spotlight and to focus in on them, uh, using police records primarily to talk about these emotional items rather than the policing itself. Um, so kind of using the content of these records against the grain of their original purpose to really try and give people um, their voices back, I guess, in the archival material. However, um, because of when these authors were writing, they were, of course, uh, there were, of course, consequences to these illicit gatherings and secret correspondence and communication. Um, so I just briefly want to revisit each case in turn. Ultimately, 
Ernie and Jeff, who met through the link, were arrested under the charge of conspiring to commit gross indecency. They were tried at the Central Criminal Court, um, the Old Bailey, and indeed that's, I believe, the court used in all of these um, occasions, showing the kind of prominence of these cases. Um, so they were charged along with two other men, and they received each received two years imprisonment with hard labour at Wormwood Scrubs. In the case of Bobby and Bert, we know that while uh, we have the letters uh, they were sent, preserved in our collections, they were not actually used as evidence in court. Newspaper reports show that Sir Hen Henry Curtis Bennett, QC, believed they ought never to have been admitted as evidence, as they could not properly be connected with the offence the appellants, uh, appellants were charged with. After all, these letters were not directly connected to the charge in question of a disorderly house, um, and some of these letters significantly predated the raid by several years, such as the uh, letters received by McNamara. However, Sir Henry uh, did concede that the letters were clearly, and I quote, of an obscene character. Although the letters were dismissed as evidence in court, Bobby received a sentence of 15 months hard labour and Bert received eight months in the second division. In the raid on the Caravan Club, 103 individuals, both men and women, were arrested and taken to Bow Street Police Station, including Cyril. Um, during his arrest, Cyril had to undergo the humiliating process of having his face tested for evidence of makeup with blotting paper. Um, and this is a reoccurring practice we see in these records. Cyril also boldly approached the police inspector during the raid in an extraordinary act of defiance, saying to him, well, I don't mind this beastly raid, but I would like to know if you can let me have one of your nice boys to come home with. I am really good. Um, the majority of individuals who were arrested uh, were uh, some of whom were labourers, some of whom were shop assistants, or waiters, uh, were found not guilty on the condition that they never frequent the club such a, get, such a club again. Cyril was committed to trial for aiding and abetting in the keeping of a disorderly house and found not guilty. Um, despite the use of these letters, which were very open um, as evidence. The club owners uh, were alternatively sentenced to hard labor for 20 and 12 months respectively. So I'm just gonna try and uh, wrap up some of the final threads from these cases. So in most cases, we know little of what ultimately happened to the individuals after their time in court. After all, these individuals were not famous, just average, often working class men who dared to love and live their sexual lives fully. Sometimes authors would use false names. Um, sometimes the letters authors would use false names and addresses to evade the law, which also makes them tricky to trace. In the case of Cyril, Ernie and Jeff, I've generally been quite unsuccessful in tracing them. Um, so on the 1921 census, we do see Ernie and Jeff uh, they're still in prison at the time, listed in Wormwood Scrubs. Uh, this stint in prison may have even been the only chance they uh, got to meet, assuming they did indeed meet in their, during their time there. Um, after this imprisonment, there's no clear evidence that they ever met again or certainly continued uh, to pursue a relationship. Cyril went by the pseudonym Cyril Coeur de Leon or Cyril the Lionheart. At the time of his arrest, he was listed as living on independent means um, and the names of his wife and child are unknown so there's kind of quite little information to cross-reference there. Um, I've yet to be able to trace him beyond this moment in time. For Bobby and Bert and the authors of the letters they received to Fitzroy Square to their Fitzroy Square flat we know a little more. Records show that not long after their prison sentence in 1929 uh, both Bobby and Bert traveled to New York I like to think they got to visit McNamara, author of so many of the letters to Bobby, to meet his husband, travel the States, and to continue to develop their wonderful queer friendships. Um, and we've got just an image of them uh, traveling together on their passenger lists. The 1939 register does show Bobby listed as single and living in Paddington. He also remained a professional dancer. In their letters, Ernie and Jeff talk openly about their frustrations with the law. So this is them writing in 1920. 
I cannot understand why it should be considered a criminal offence for two people of the same sex who are fond of each other and mutually agreed to commit sodomy. It would take a further 40 years for the state to partially decriminalise homosexual acts. Essentially, it's likely that 22-year-old Ernie would have lived the majority of his life having to hide his sexuality from the law and wider society. For Bobby, on the other hand, records show he lived to the age of 100. He'd been born in 1900 and would have lived through many changes in the law. For a significant period of Bobby's life, the 1967 Sexual Offences Act would have been in force, decriminalising homosexual acts in private. So in conclusion, these letters now provide a remarkable and rare insight into LGBTQ lives in the 1920s and 1930s. They tell stories of love and friendship, but also of criminalization. They illustrate that these relationships went beyond metropolitan areas traditionally associated with LGBTQ life, spreading all over the UK and beyond. But they also leave us with many questions. How many men they ab felt able to take such risks in corresponding? How many letters don't survive in police collections because people were able to evade the law? Or how many letters were burned or destroyed through fear? How many women's experiences of same-sex love existed or exist in letters and how do they differ? And fundamentally, what still exists in collections, in other archives, in people's attics even, waiting to be found? Despite the reason they were kept, these wonderful letters can tell us huge amounts about the queer community and LGBTQ networks at the time. They reflect many different emotions, reciprocated and unreciprocated love, romance and friendship between men, and navigating a queer identity in an era that essentially criminalized your love. These letters highlight the risks uh, gay men were willing to take, their bold defiance in the face of the law and the universality of love that can be found in these pages. Um, there are so many little known stories to be told about LGBTQ history um, at the National Archives and this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so as well as records around criminalization and, and defiance, we also see things around censorship and particularly in relation to lesbian lives. Um, there were records about uh, people's work for government, LGBT people uh, working for government, for example, Chevalier de Aon, um, one of the earliest known cases of uh, a gender non-conforming individual in our collections. Uh, the work of people like Alan Turing means that he intersects with our collections. Um, there are everyday reasons that people um, come into our records uh, in relation to their LGBT kind of experiences. So the will of Eleanor Butler, one of the ladies of Langothlin, uh, the change of name of Elton John, the naturalization certificate of Freddie Mercury, um, all sorts of reasons. And then increasingly we get records about campaigning and the law and more kind of positive change. Um, so, so records around those themes as well. So there's absolutely tons to explore beyond just the kind of the letters in the collection as well. Um, and more can be found through our blogs, uh, podcasts. We've got a LGBTQ podcast episode um, and through our social media channels as well. Um, and as I focus really in this talk on the 1920s, I thought I would just um, flag our current exhibition um, called The 1920s Beyond the Raw, which looks at the rich diverseness of the 1920s. Um, that's a free exhibition on site, but there's lots of online programming linked to it as well, including a tour of the exhibition space on YouTube um, and various online events. So if you're interested, I'd recommend signing up to our mailing list to find out more. Um, so essentially, thank you very much for listening. Um, and I'm now very willing to take some questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vicky. That was really wonderful. Um, and yes, please do check out that exhibition. I was lucky enough to get to the last exhibition in the National Archives that he also worked on. And I believe was um, one, of, one of those letters at least was in that exhibition, right? Which one was it? That was the Cyril and Morris one, yeah. The yeah. kind of love letter from the Caravan Club. It was hard yeah. to choose what to, which one to pick for that. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so you don't have any uh, questions yet, so please do get them in if you have one. We do have a very nice comment from Richard O'Leary, um, hello Richard. Uh, Richard says, thanks so much Vicky for your fascinating presentation and especially for highlighting the range of emotions felt by these men. 1926 census when available may tell us more about Ernie and Jeff. 
Um, yes. And I, I think that is really interesting um, but how you use and how scholars now are using more and more family history to sort of, you know, read it against the grain by like looking at a ship manifest, which of course is initially a very dry source, you might think very technical, but actually when you, when you can kind of contextualize it like you do, you can really find quite amazing stories. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. Question I had um, when you were speaking was about whether you have any sense of broader, a kind of a broader social history around when people are prosecuted, you know, are there kind of, it, it struck me as a um, remarkable kind of the efforts that the police went to in a way. And was there a kind of specific moral panics at cer in certain years that led to there be the more source material being generated than let's say in other years? Um, yeah, I think that would be a, a fair observation. Um, the, the police themselves get quite a bit of backlash because they seem to be kind of, it, it's almost borderline entrapment with some of the situations. And so actually even the home office at the time isn't particularly keen on the, the approach. Um, I mean, it's it's quite interesting seeing some of the, the observations by police in particularly in the clubs and venues um, where they would literally pretend to be patrons um, and get quite involved in the situation. So um, I think it, it wasn't without its controversy, but I, I do think you see kind of some of these flashpoints um, where there was definitely more of a focus um, on kind of um, queer lives at the time. Um, but I think that, yeah, there might also be kind of other reasons behind that and the, the main points that we have records. Um, as wonderful as, as the, the letters are, um, I think it's relatively unlikely we'll find many more. And in a way, that's a good thing, you know, that people's lives weren't policed in that way as much as they are fascinating. Um, I think they're, they're more kind of rare examples rather than the norm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, <clears throat> it's, uh, it, it's interesting. I'd also love to know whether we can kind of read a geography of this as well you know mm. I thought it was interesting the Isle of Wight uh, you know um and here I'm also here in Belfast at the moment researching how this is policed in uh, Northern Ireland so mm. I guess as, as more research is done we can kind of try and, and pick out different kind of geographical particularities but also common points and it'd be interesting kind of map arrests mm. and, and prosecutions across um, the UK to see how, how that played out. Yeah, definitely. I think um, we have a particular bias in our collections because we have the London Metropolitan Police records and not other ones. And that is a frustrating bias because it leads to an even more kind of London centric view. But mm. when we look at publications like The Link, something like that, that has far more examples than, say, the, the kind of more unique examples of the love letters, just people um, putting their kind of uh, 25 word uh, kind of um classified adverts in there they come from all over the country and beyond so I think with something like that you can really see a kind of a spread a geographical spread of people um, that were interested in meeting uh, mm. so so yeah it's not I, like I say I think the, the love letters in some instances are more rare so it's harder to map them like that and they're very much specific to, to metropolitan police records in our collection but more generally I think I think it would be brilliant to try and map and records like the link really help us to do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great so <clears throat> there's a question and another nice comment so we knew with comment atlas o'hare notes that was so fascinating vicky i hope more can be uncovered someday from the perspective of women of women that would be amazing to see and then a question from fintan mccarthy who asks have you found examples in other archives for example in ireland or europe or the us um, so in terms of other archives, I haven't. Um, I tend to be quite rooted to the National Archives collections because of my role, um, but I would love the opportunity to explore more. So maybe, yeah, maybe that's something I can I can look into kind of, um, yeah, a, a way that I could I could do that more um, because I do think there would be a huge richness in that um, to, to look at those networks. And um, I'm particularly interested, I think, to try and trace McNamara in America and see see what happened to him and his partner um so I, I think there's there's definitely lots of lots of potential 
um, which I'd be keen to explore. Um, in terms of women's records, uh, I think we often end up just using different records. So increasingly I've been using uh, records like wills uh, to kind of read into to queer relationships between women. Um, they obviously don't have quite the personality that shines through of these kind of 1920s records, but um, uh, there's still a lot of potential there, I think. So I think thinking outside the box is really helpful for some of those less, less re represented uh, identities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I, I'm always um, banging the drum about wills. I think wills are, are underutilized. I know at least any I've had to use, I've needed to spend a tenner to access each one, but mm. it's worth it because, you know, it's it's obviously very meaningful who you leave your estate to um, and it can it tell a great deal. And mm. in the cases where I've used it, I've actually been able to find who has inherited the materials. So that's been really useful too. Mm. Um, we should close up soon because we want to transition to the last talk. So if anyone has any questions, do get them in now. Before that, thanks so much, Vicky. That was really, really fascinating. It's really, it's strange, you know, to find the adjective for it because you want to say wonderful, mm. but there's also such a, you know, there's such a sadness and a tragedy behind mm. how the material exists at all. So, you know, it, it is yeah. difficult to find the right the right words for it, but it's mm. certainly an extremely rich story that, that you've been able to tell with it. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's been yeah a pleasure to talk about. So thank you. Great. So I think we'll um uh we'll all come we'll come back then at six for our final talk, which is uh, Sarah Phillips speaking about Ireland and the road to gender to gender recognition 1990 to 2015. So Everyone can go ahead and make more of a tea around thing. And finally, thanks again, Vicky. So just feel free to just log off as normal. That was brilliant. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Great. And I will also close off my camera until six and make myself a mug of tea.